بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهد الله فلا مضل له وما يهد فلا نجد له وليا مرشدا إن شاء الله today we're going to be talking uh, talking about the manners of students علما this is part three and last time we talked about uh, we talked about following the salihin and we talked about the importance of of finding a role model and we said that the role model is going to be the the, the prophets the sahaba the tabi'in and tabi'i tabi'in and we mentioned last time that every type any type of any type of uh, any type uh, any path that you do it actually starts with imitation and whether you are taking secular secular studies or whether you're taking you're taking islamic studies it all starts with you trying to put in an imagination and trying to put in inside your head what it means and what type of a person you want to imitate and that's why even allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually told us the stories of the the, the anbiya the stories of the anbiya uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the stories of the Anbiya that this is where the, the stories of the Anbiya start. Where are you on that story? How do you complete that story from your side? And this is very important to remember. Don't, con don't consider and never disconnect yourself from the stories because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that's how the story began. How do you complete the story? Where are you in the spectrum on that story? How do you do it? Who do you feel you're part of? And that's why when we look at Aqidah, there's Aqidah al-Wala wal bara And Aqidah al-Wala wal bara is actually a core part of Aqidah because it is actually you determining that I am part of this group. Or I am not part of that group. And that's why when we look at the Anbiya, when we look at the story of the Sahaba, it's about you remembering and putting yourself on, on that story and trying to and being proud to be from the Salihin. Or am I man fahuwa minhum? Or am I going to be imitating another group? Now, when we speak of imitating, a group, even imitating the Salihin, a tashabbuh bil Salihin, or imitating the Salihin, even if Shaitan comes to you and is going to tell you that you're not from them, so why do you dress like as if you are religious? You know you're not. That's not your reality. You know that that's not really who you are. You're just being a munafiq. That's Shaitan's game on you. That's the scheme that Shaitan will use on you. Now, on the other side. Remember, even if you're not part of the Salihin, imitating the Salihin is part of success. When we say Salihin, we're talking about Anbiya, we're talking about Sahaba. And speaking of Sahaba, one of the very beautiful things, of course, we don't have a lot of information about Anbiya. Yeah, we do have a lot of information about about Prophet uh, Prophet Musa alayhi salam or some uh, some uh, some other uh, anbiya, but not really a lot of detail that that will a lot of times probably relate every single story to one part of our life, and that's why I think it is very important, and I've seen that in my own household, saying the stories, taking one sahaba. Go to the Sahaba alphabetically, choose one Sahabi at a time. Make just 15 minutes and just talk about one Sahabi every single day. You form it as a group that today we're going to speak about the Sahabi. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the Sahabi. In the beginning, all those names are going to be confusing. In the beginning, all those names are going to seem so foreign to you. Later, later on, down the road, Every single name is going to have a connection with you. Even in the future, when you're going to become mothers. In the future, when, you're, when, when you become mothers, every single day, today we're going to speak about the Sahabi. You might think that your child is not paying attention, but your child is paying attention. Your child will actually 
you will actually start remembering a lot of names and guess what? They'll actually have that connection with the Sahaba and they'll actually make them be their celebrities. This is really important to say because who you take as a celebrity, who you take as your role model is, is, the, is the person that you're going to start imitating. When you start taking the Sahaba, the Sahaba one after another, you'll start to build in that connection with them and you'll feel that connection with them and you will start feeling like they're part of you. Now, same thing with the Tabirin. The Tabirin, they, the, Tabirin, they didn't see the Prophet ﷺ, but they lived with the Sahaba. And taking one Tabiri and another Tabiri and seeing the lifestyle that they lived in the midst of that Tarbiya, in the midst of that Tarbiya, and, and this is something that we're really missing. It's so sad when we actually talk about manners, manners, and, and, and manners, and the adab of Talab al Um I think mentorship in Tarbiya, we miss that a lot. Because I'll tell you, in my university, when I was, when I used to learn, and when I was a student at Kulit al-Da'u Usul al-Din, our professors would be mentoring us. Um, I'm not sure if I said that this here, but our professors would be mentoring us um, in the way we even walk down the hall, the hallway. They would tell us. Girls, you shouldn't be talking and with your loud voices in the middle of the hall. Or when we had a professor who was a professor in Hadith. Her name is Dr. Maryam Saleh. She was a professor in Hadith from Umm al Qura and even had an honors um, in, in, in Hadith. And she would be the one to even be with us in the bathroom. In the bathroom meaning mutawadda. And we would watch... I'll tell you, when me as a little girl, I didn't know what being religious meant. I didn't know. Generally, my family, like a traditional Palestinian family, I didn't know what being religious meant. So I would watch to see the people like down in the Masjid Al-Aqsa. What do they wear under their jibbeh? What does she wear under her hijab? So what are they doing? Believe it or not, but I remember one time walking down uh, Al-Quds and the lady was struggling to, ha- to hold her, her children. So I just pa- was passing by. So I pitched in to help her carry one of her children. So she, sh- she told me, Jazakallahu khairan. I didn't know how to respond. I, didn't, I never heard this. So I went back home and I told my dad, I said, some lady told me, Allah jazaki, something like that. What is that? And then he told me what it meant. Now, this is part of that tarbiya. Even, even in the area. And that's why choosing the environment to help you with tarbiya is extremely important. When you say choosing the environment to help you with tarbiya, because tarbiya a lot of times you don't control your own tarbiya. Your own tarbiya. You control it by choosing the environment to, contr- to, to uh, raise it. Meaning what? If you want to get the tarbiya of a mu'min, be in the masjid as often as you can. Because you'll surround yourself with people that are trying to be salihin. If you, if you don't realize, if you don't realize the change on yourself, the people in the masjid, when it comes to tarbiya, what is the word tarbiya? Tarbiya, it's a process. Tarbiya. It take, it's a gradual thing. It doesn't come within, within a day or two. Tarbiya, it's, take, it's going to be giving that supervision and that change 
and that mentorship all together in order to bring about the complete, the complete um, discipline. Now, in order to get the tarbiya, remember the guy that killed the 99 people? The guy that killed the 99 people? The guy that killed the 99 people? Now, that, that guy, in the end, he was told to do what? To leave the city. Change the city. Change the area that you're in. And that's very important when it comes to tarbiya. You may be surrounding yourself with the wrong people and it may be the reason why you're going through the wrong tarbiya. Surrounding yourself with the salihin will let you find the right tarbiya. Now, when we talk about, well, who do I take as a role model? Remember, in order for you to find the role model, Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're talking about. Look at how they joke. Look at the way they're dressed. Look at the way they, they, they talk, they eat. Look at what they care about. This is really important because the way they talk, the topics that they care about, the way they dress tells you a lot. We don't have a tool to see what people are on the inside, what they really are on the inside. But we can generally look at the outside to see, did that heart get the Iman or not? Did that heart get the Iman or not? Because a true mu'min would not be making a clown of himself and joking too often. Because their heart would actually have hubbi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their heart would be thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's absolutely no way that you can joke that often. If you really had khushur. If the person had the salihin, had the salihin as their example, you would not see them. Imitating al fusaq What is al fusaq A fasiq is somebody that got used to the ma'asiyah, that got used to sin. There's absolutely no way. If the heart did not like that ma'asiyah, you would have not seen it on their action. But because their heart, the word is... Um, the, the word is ushribat. It absorbed, their heart absorbed that sin. They started seeing it as good. Kind of like what we said about um, about uh, Prophet Lut, the people of Prophet Lut. They started seeing sin as if it's something ugly or beautiful. And then what was what was their accusation for Prophet Lut? Oh, there are people that are seeking pure purity. There are people seeking purity and they start seeing purification as disgusting. And that's why when you look at sin, it, the sin changes who the person is. Not just that, but sin changes their perception. They will start seeing things like tattooing, or things like piercing, or the list goes on and on, they will actually start saying, I like it. I think it's nice. Why did they start seeing it as nice? Because they surrounded themselves with these types of people. They started seeing it as nice. Now, if you tell them, it's not the libas of salihin, why would you want to do it? No, I think it's nice. Prove it to me. It became something that they surrounded themselves with that they don't even see anymore that it contradicts a pure fitrah. That it's harming the body. They'll start seeing it as nice. Without us realizing, our hearts 
have the capacity to absorb and imitate from the from the environment that it that it gets used to and the environment that it gets used to starts becoming that frame that it shapes you on the inside and on the outside now generally when we speak about when we speak about imitating the salihin be aware of those that delude islam we talked about this before you're going to get a lot of people that will delude islam for you and will tell you a lot of a lot of different different so and so called interpretations which is really not necessarily a scholars or even what the quran itself or the hadith itself is saying but it'll be their interpretation which is actually outside of the arabic language or even the prophet sallallahu the prophet sallallahu uh, interpretation but without you realizing many are going to make it seem like it is very quranic based or very hadith based because it would be taken out of context and cherry picked from quran or sunnah and that's why remember it's when we talk about adab of talab al ilm it is very important not to necessarily look for those that speak eloquently but those that speak with ilm sometimes the people that have the ilm may not have the tool for spreading ilm meaning what somebody that might have the ilm might just be boring in delivering their ilm somebody that might not have the ilm might just have the tool for spreading it now as a talib ilm you're not looking as a talib ilm you're not looking for the dish and how it looks you're looking for the nutrition in what it feeds right nutrition and what it feeds that's a talib ilm and you got to distinguish yourself many out there do need the people that are eloquent in speech even in giving a nice khutbah or the people that just know how to get to the hearts sometimes they may not have that but they just know how to at least touch the hearts of the people all right this is really important pay attention so for example if you look at generally the public some people or let me say 80% of the people need somebody to attract them and those 80% of the people are usually the layman the random common muslims that are still that are still trying to find that are still trying to find somebody that that can attract them to the deen and that's 80% of the muslimin 80% of the muslimin you would have to find you would have to you know just 80% of the muslimin they they're just looking for somebody to attract them to just even talk about simple things about deen but a talib ilm must not be one of those because talib al ilm aims high talib al ilm because they, they aim high they act as not the 20% but the other 10% may be the people that might have some ilm but they there's an a smaller 10% for talib al ilm for talibat al ilm only 10% of the people will be going for the butter if you are always just with the majority are you really part of talib al ilm or are you part of the layman that's what you want to ask yourself i'm not saying that it's bad 
to be part of those that listen to the people, I mean, that might give wad, a nice small revat. It's not wrong. No, sometimes I listen to those myself. Yeah, a lot of times I can pick a lot of mistakes, but still. I mean, even a chef, right, used to sit and listen to the halakhahs of people that are less, um, less knowledgeable than he is, just because he wants to get... He asked Abdullah ibn Mas'ud to read from to read him Quran and he just said, Am I gonna read it? Am I gonna read it on you when it was revealed on you? And the Prophet ﷺ told him that I love hearing it from, from others that when 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 others uh, read it. And that's the same thing. It's okay to hear. I'm not saying don't listen to to the rest of the people. But what I'm saying is what I'm saying is is that if you're a talib ilm don't only look for those that are eloquent and giving nice talks. Look for those that are giving real in. In the beginning, it might be boring. In the beginning, it might be boring. But if you want to be a talib al-ilm, a leader has to go and aim high. When a leader aims high, they're basically the smaller group because you cannot have too many leaders. So be from those that look for ilm, even if the shaykh was not good in delivering the ilm. Not everybody has the tool, the skill of get, of presenting ilm. You've got some shuyukh they, that may not have the tool and the skill for giving the ilm, but they do. Have the ilm. And here in Minnesota, for example, believe it or not, we have some of the best scholars in Quran and in Hadith. <coughs> to give you just an example, in Masjid al Faruq, Dr. Walid al Manisi is one of the best scholars in Quran and Quran worldwide. Dr. Sheikh Tariq Awadallah is one of the best muhaddithin worldwide. Guess what? You go to their classes, there's probably only four or five people there. You guys, these people are internationally. There's very, very, very few of them. Maybe only three or four people world or maybe ten people worldwide. How many people do you see in their halaqahs? Three, four, five. Let's give an example on somebody else. Let's just suppose this is not to lessen from anybody, but there's no doubt that some of the students, when they come to Minnesota, students of Ilm, you'll see the convention center packed, sold out. Right? I'm not saying that they're necessarily bad, but I'm saying that Majority of the people don't necessarily look for the ulama. Majority of the people, majority of the people look for for a less level in order for them to understand it. What you're trying to get to, if you're a talib ilm, you're trying to get to that level that barely anybody understands them. Why do these scholars have barely any students? Because barely and barely anybody understands their level of ilm. So they will get lost. So nobody comes to them. Because they're too scholarly. It becomes like a jargon to them. No, seriously, it becomes like a jargon to them. So they won't, they won't be sitting down there. Because they won't understand anything. So even if you tell them, that we've got the scholar. Yeah, that's nice, but I'm sorry, I didn't understand anything. So they'll leave. For a talib ilm, if you aim high, yes, there are some grand. If you are a talib ilm, lights and spotlights and where everybody is going is not necessarily where you should be walking. This is for talib ilm. I'm not saying don't go 
when this or that Shaykh or Maghrib Institute, when they do, on, in contrast, I think what they're doing is an excellent job and I think go to it and I think, uh, I think um, it's a very good, I think it's a very good um, gradual step to actually take to learn from to learn from uh, from those from those mashayikh in order to help you go up the ladder because unfortunately we either have very scholarly or very low in in um, very low in level so we need to get into how do we get the people in between is right now our problem how do we get to the the people in between in order to get those that are very low in their level in order to get them to join those scholars. Now, um, we mentioned that one before, I believe. Now, one, the other part what, for the students of ilm, just like you need to have the sabr, just like you need to have the sabr in, in, um, in seeking ilm, and finding the people to imitate, you also need to be steadfast on piety. What is what is being steadfast on piety? Being steadfast on piety. The most beautiful thing, the most beautification, let me call it this way, the most beautiful beautification that you can have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى Who can we finish it? ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ Allah عليك وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ What is لِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى? If you go to the hospital, the doctors have an attire, right? The nurses have an attire. The medical assistant people have an attire. The, the, the secretaries have an attire, right? Each one has a certain dress code. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, لِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ The dress code of taqwa. Now, لِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى can be the outside attire, meaning those. And لِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى can also be the outside figure of yourself. The best figure that you can have is the figure of taqwa. Dhalika khair. That is the best attire. Now, but outside is not always really reflecting what's on the inside. But one way in order to change what's on the inside is by changing what's on the outside. In order to control what's on the outside, you need to control what. Uh, sorry, what's on the outside? You control what's in on the inside. The outside and the inside, meaning the heart, both relate to one another. If you are trying to change what's on the outside, you have to work on. In Allah, لا يغير ما بقوم إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change your situation unless you change what's on the inside. In order for you to change what's on the inside, remember, you have to practice freedom. Freedom? Yes, freedom. How? La ilaha illallah. What is la ilaha illallah? Freeing yourself from worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Freeing yourself from worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning what? That nobody tells you how to wear, nobody tells you how to, uh, what to do, and nobody tells you what's the most important thing that you should be doing, or nobody gives you all these different orders, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're submitting only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in order, Ibn Taya explains, that Worship is doing everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes. Worship is doing everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes, whether from the oral words or the outer actions and behavior and from the actions of the heart, meaning your intentions. 
When it comes to worship, if you are talking in vain talk like it's cool, are you really worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or are you trying to imitate? Look at the Prophet sallam. The Prophet sallam in the hadith he said, ليس المؤمن بالطعان ولا اللعان ولا الفاحش ولا البذيء. ليس المؤمن بالطعان. A believer doesn't curse, doesn't damn things. ولا اللعان. الطعان, sorry, الطعان is more the person that's always, that's always bashing others. اللعان is the person that's cursing things. ولا الفاحش. الفاحش is, is using explicit terms for issues that are supposed to be private. You guys know what I mean? والبذيء. Very close to it where the person is using, is talking about issues that are supposed to be done in private. Talking about it in public. And this is in, in all cultures, not necessarily in Western only, but in all cultures, it's usually the talk of the sufaha. It's usually, or it is, the talk of the sufaha. The people that are immanered, illicit. The people that have become accustomed to ma'asiyah. And that's why when we look at the akhlaq, what the person is always getting them, their, their talk used to, their talk, their outside behavior, how are they dealing with the outside world, and also their heart, what is their heart busy with, is usually who that person is. And that's why when we look at talk, Talib al-ilm and a random Muslim should not be using any type of ill-mannered words whatsoever. Even if you're swearing at a table, don't swear at a table. A good Muslim does not use this kind of, this kind of talk because it actually expresses the person and the type of culture that he's exposing his mind, his ears, his environment as part of that, 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 those words. There's absolutely no way that anybody can be using this type of, these types of words unless they got used to that type of environment. Right? There's no way. Now, when we talk about practicing submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're submitting your, 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 um, your talk, you're submitting your ears and what they hear, you're submitting your eyes and what they look at, you're submitting your, your, um, uh, your, uh, your behavior, you're submitting, we said you're, um, we're, you're submitting even your feelings and your heart to, to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your five senses. When you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then and only then is your heart, is your mind going to be prepared for talab al -ilm. Listen to this, you guys. There's no way that your heart can be prepared for talab al -ilm if your heart is busy in a haram environment. No way. Now that type of environment is going to be the one that's affecting you. And remember, your actions reveal the knowledge of Islam and the spirituality of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here's the thing. Many, when you stand firm, and you guys listen, many, especially since most of you are teenagers, Many will try when you first practice that, that, um, the, the manners and the akhlaq of the salihin. Many will try to act sarcastic with you and try to put you down in order to, to let me say, make you lose confidence in yourself and be one of them. Many will try to shake in your confidence. But you want to know one thing. Stand firm 
Be confident. Because when you stand firm, firm and when you're confident, that is the only time that one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you more and more ilm when you stand in front of the challenges. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُ سُبُّ لَنَا Simple. If you, act, if you stand firm in front of those challenges, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to guide you for His paths. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُّ لَنَا You do one jihad and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors for you. And remember, ilm is part of those subul. Ilm is part of those paths. In order to get those to those paths, you have to work on being confident. Even when those around you, especially when you're teenagers, you will get a lot of people that are trying to shake your confidence. By the way, Maghrib, at what time is it? When others try to shake your confidence, lots of times, and unfortunately right now even, even some talibat ilm, I'm starting to see that very often, where they make clowns of themselves thinking that it makes you cool, or it makes you at least closer to the public and to the populace. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, without them realizing, this is actually, this is actually taking the level down of ilm. Even if you want to connect to the populace, it does not mean that you give up on the adab of of al of al ulama, the adab of tulab al ilm. You don't give up on it, but you're supposed to elevate them. And I don't want to mention names. Some of them talabit ilm and some of them actually worldwide known and actually use some certain terms. This is not whatsoever appropriate for talab al ilm. Even if they use that adab, it does remember when you want to take a role model, do not take a role model from the people that are alive. Because al hayla tu'man alayhi fitnatu. The person that's alive, you can never guarantee that they're not going to face trials. You want to take an example of somebody that died, and we know that they died on Iman. Because the Sahaba, they used to be afraid from one hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ actually said in the hadith that the person might do the action of the people of Ahl. To the point that there wouldn't be any distance between them and except the dhira, which is this size. This is the hand size almost, an arm size. Yet, then what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had known before they were even created, predestination, then they will do the action of Ahl al Why? In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ clarifies that they were doing the action of people of Ahl al-Jannah They were doing the, the action of the people of Ahl al-Jannah based on what people see. So people saw them that they were doing actions of Ahl al-Jannah. But the reality is different. And when we speak about when we speak about um, acting in piety, and we said we said that um, you know changes of time and environment, remember, regardless of the place and regardless of the time, piety and manners stand on principles. The principles of piety. Regardless of the culture, waqar, honor, regardless of the culture, is the core of piety in Islam as well. No scholar is considered a scholar 
unless they're actually implementing that piety and you see it. And because implementing that piety reveals their deep understanding of the ilm. Now knowledge and ilm, it calls for action. It's not just an information to put in your mind. So the person is either calling, is either calling for just ilm and the ulama used to say, هَتَفَ الْعِلْمُ بِالْعَمَلِ فَإِنْ أَجَابَهُ وَإِلَّا ارْتَحَلْ Ilm called on to action. Ilm would call on to action. Action might respond to it. If it doesn't, it'll walk off. Who's it'll walk off? Ilm. Ilm will walk off if it does not if it does not answer the call. Now, another part of Talab al-Ilm is continual observance. What do we mean by continual observance? Continual observance in where the person is continuously observing their akhlaq in public and in private. Unfortunately, at many times we would see whether brothers or sisters when they're in public or around non-Muslims, they become part of them. When they're around Muslims, they're salihin. But a good mu'min, whether in public, whether around Muslims or not around Muslim, not around Muslims or non-Muslims, they would still, they would always practice piety, they would always practice the akhlaq, because remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually watching you, and one thing that I always mention is that remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing dhikr, there are three different types of dhikr number one there's the oral dhikr oral dhikr, whether it's in memorizing Qur'an, or whether it's in doing tasbih, istighfar, tahmeed, etc. Now, or there's audio dhikr. What is audio dhikr? Audio dhikr, you're listening to a lecture, you're listening to Qur'an, you're listening to, to good talk. This is audio dhikr. There's the visual dhikr. The visual dhikr, you're taking a moment to see around you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're seeing around you the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the visual dhikr. Every single mu'min needs to take one part of dhikr. There's even the dhikr in action. Listen to this, you guys. There's even the dhikr in action. How's the dhikr in action? You just wearing hijab, you're doing your dhikr in action. Isn't libas al-taqwa thalika khayr? Is it libas al-taqwa, the dress of taqwa, that's the best? Libas al-taqwa is a type of dhikr. See, sisters, we do dhikr that guys don't do. And many sisters are always feeling, you know, it's like, how come the brothers get to, get to go do uh, al-adhan? Al-adhan is easy to do. Especially in America. Al-adhan... It's easy to do. You do it in the masjid and nobody's going to attack you. But libas taqwa that dress dhikr, you could be in danger at all times. So for the sisters that are always wondering, well, how come can we have a, a sister's masjid and can we ha how come the sisters can't do adhan? Excuse me? You're always doing adhan. You're doing adhan of, you're doing the dhikr that no brother can do. You stand high. You stand strong. When you're wearing that hijab, nobody will confuse you for anybody that says Allahu Akbar. Your hijab is saying Allahu Akbar. And that's why your hijab, like in France, they consider it as the biggest threat in the world because it reminds them of the, the, the war, La Poitiers. The war that, the, the, the war that they had faced and faced with the Muslims where at one point they were almost defeated by the Muslims, by Abdul Rahman al-Ghafiqi. At one point, 
it reminds them, hijab just reminds them, hijab just reminds them of that. You say you don't do Allahu Akbar. You say, oh, I wish I can do that then. Some Hanabila said you can do that then if it's an only women's, women's area. But your dhikr is a special type of dhikr. A special type. It's a different kind of dhikr. Allahu Akbar in the highest words. When everybody else is bragging about being an object and looking blank, you are saying, I'm looking like Sayyida Maryam. I'm standing where I say in my highest words, in my, li my, my loudest voice, Allahu Akbar, and that I will not have anybody decide what I wear and decide what I look like or decide what makes me important except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I should have added right here, maybe we can add it so we can always remember it. Dhikr in attire. Dhikr in attire. Why? Because the ayah says, Nibasu taqwa dhalika khair. Nibasu taqwa dhalika khair. Another form of dhikr. Right? The other part, when we talk about the continual observance, and it comes with the different types of dhikr, in order to help you, in order to give you that support as a talib ilm and as a mu'min, you also need the humility and being humble. What is being humble? Being humble, being, be humble to learn. Be humble towards others. Be humble towards the other students. Be humble towards those that are trying to learn. And be humble towards that are less knowledgeable than you. And be humble to learn from others that may be at the same level of ilm, the same level of your ilm, but she probably has an ijazah in Quran. He's your age, but she has an ijazah in your Quran. In Quran, be a talib ilm to her too. At one point, remember, the ulama used to say, "Da'al ilm bayn athnayn, al kibru wal hayat." Ilm is lost between two things, pride and shyness. She's too proud to seek ilm or too shy to seek ilm. She doesn't want others to see that she doesn't know. Now, when we talk about being humble, when we talk about being humble, it's very important to remember that being humble actually means you don't see yourself as the center or better than others. Because when, when you see yourself better than others, that's the, that's the road that killed, or let me call it the graveyard, of the graveyard of leaders too. Why? Because once pride comes in, they have set the first foot. They have set the first foot for their burial. And now they're going down. Not to mention that pride is a type of hypocrisy. The Prophet ﷺ said, Anybody that has one iota of pride in their heart will not enter Jannah. Part of pride is putting others down in order to raise yourself. Or argue with others and being argumentative for the sake of nothing but proving others wrong and you being right. Especially girls, inshallah, all of you will get pious husbands. There's nothing like getting a pious husband. Let me tell you, let me tell you one thing. One very common thing that women do 
and also men, not just women, but everybody. But especially when you're in a marriage, when you try to go into an argument without you realizing you're trying to win the argument and you lose your in-laws or your husband's heart because you just were too argumentative. Being argumentative is one of the worst habits. And unfortunately, I'll tell you, being argumentative is one of the worst manners any wife can have. If you are argumentative, change that manner as soon as possible, or else it will end your relationship with others, including your husband. Many women got divorced because of that habit. Listen. A very important saying, كسب القلوب أولى من كسب المواقف. What does that mean? Win, winning the heart is more important than winning the argument. Make that as the slogan for your life. Winning the heart is more important than winning the argument. Because when you, when you are so focused on winning the argument, you don't realize that you're, to the person that's in front of you, you have put yourself as the center. Without you realizing, the other person, even if you are right, because you are so focused on trying to win the argument, their ego starts acting in defense. What happens when you so much want to work on winning the argument? You lost the person, you lost their heart, you lost the listening ear. Especially if you're married. Do not let your argument take longer than five minutes. Five minutes. If it's taking longer, just walk away, write it down, email it to your husband, or te text it to him. But don't let the argument be face to face, heated. Oh, yeah, I really mean it. Write it down, email it to him, or text it to him. Same thing for him, but I'm talking to girls, so I'm directing my, my talk to them or at them. All right? Do not let the argument take more than five minutes. If the person is, from the first five minutes, they're not listening, they're, they're just talking to themselves. It becomes a monologue, not a dialogue. In order for it to be a dialogue, they have to hear you. Write it down and send it to them, let them read it. Take a silent, silent moment for reading. It won't be a dialogue if we're just going to be arguing back. Now, that's not just with the husband, but that's even with your friends. Win the heart. Don't focus on winning the argument only. Win the heart. Even if, for example, you go into an argument for the sake of winning the, the sisterhood, let it pass. For the sake of winning the sisterhood, for the sake of winning her heart, because she's more important than the argument. The idea, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change it later on, if it's haq. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change it. But don't lose a sister for your ego. <laughs> Now, the other part, when we talk about being humble, revealing other sin to insinuate your piety. And this is something very common. That they would want to reveal other sin in order to say, I'm better than them, I don't do this. Now listen to this. There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ actually says, do not 
make fun of somebody else's fitna. Let you fall in that same fitna. And it will become a challenge to you. And this is very important. If a sister happens to fall in fitna, don't talk about her sin. You reveal her sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let you fall in the same type of challenge, the same type of trial. And you will be, you will be in that position because you were trying to just reveal somebody else's sin. Part on Judgment Day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cover those that covered other people's sins. Your duty is not to reveal other people's sins. Your duty is to cover people's sins and to guide them to the to, to haqq. Always practice being humble and be aware of the disease of the tyranny. Pride, greed, jealousy are the first sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was disobeyed in. Remember, Iblis, he said, Am I going to prostrate to who you created from, from, from clay? Because he regarded himself as a higher, in a higher position or better. Pride, again, is the graveyard of Talab al -ilm. Now, the other part which is very important which is is zuhd is zuhd is rarely talked about because unfortunately many confuse zuhd and think that it's only the talk of sufis that's actually not true zuhd is islam zuhd is not a sufi talk it's actually islam but unfortunately indeed sufis were probably the best to talk But many, that's their focus. Talk about zuhud and talk about tawab. And I think they did the best job in talking about akhlaq. And talking about how to be humble and be humble with others. What is zuhud? Zuhud is not in being poor. But zuhud in not letting the dunya be your focus. Zuhd, you can be a millionaire, but to you, money and wealth will not change your heart because your money and your wealth is in your hand and not in your heart. When we talk about zuhd, it also means that you don't care about what others have because to you, you look into it from the perspective that it's all dunya anyways. It's all going to be gone. When you talk about zuhd, when you talk about zuhd, you talk some of the, a different definition of seeing zuhd. It's not about wearing the, 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 the wool clothes or rag of clothes and, and uh, no, that's not what it is. Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani, who's that? Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani was one of the scholars of the Hanafi Madhab. Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani said, um, when he was told, did you write about Zuhd? He said, I wrote a book on the rulings of, on the rulings of al buyu'a meaning on the rulings of business and selling. Why? How's that zuhd? Because a true mu'min, somebody that truly has zuhd, it's not about, it's not about not having money, but it's about being keen that everything was done in the halal way. All right? Who's Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybin? Let me guys tell you a story. Let me tell you about Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. Um, or let me, let me tell you about al-Shaybani. Let me start with al-Shaybani to, to give you guys an idea about Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. You guys heard of al-Shaybani? 
What's his name? Who's a Shafi'i? Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i. Listen to this. Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i was born, was born in Gaza. Where's Gaza? Palestine. Now, Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaibani, he was originally from Mecca. But his dad went to Gaza and he was born in Gaza. Then, at the age of two, his dad died. So his mother decided that, let me take him back to our family, at least we'll have family there in order to take care of him. She takes him back to Mecca. Yet, because at the time, they considered the city being polluted. So they would send the children, just like the Prophet ﷺ was sent for, um, for, uh, for the for Halima Saadiya, Muhammad ibn al Hassan al Shaybani was sent for the tribe of Bani Hudayn. Bani Hudayn. There he learned poetry. Why was he learning poetry? Because poetry was the, the tool that they used to learn Arabic through. They wanted to make sure that he spoke Arabic in the most fusha way and in the most accurate pronunciation. What happened was is that Muhammad ibn Idris was a Shafi'i. Once he finished with Bani Hudayt and learning poetry from then he continued to become a student of all the scholars in Mecca. Now in Mecca, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i was now considered one of the best students in Mecca. So the, the wali, who is actually like the minister, kind of or the minister, or you could say the governor of Mecca, he was told that, okay, he graduated from all the scholars of Mecca. Now it was time for him to go to the other best scholar, and that happens to be in Medina. So what did he tell him? The governor of Mecca wrote a note that he should be going to the governor or to the, the scholar, the best scholar at the time in Medina. And that's going to be Malik ibn Anas. Imam Malik, the scholar, Imam Ahl al hijra the scholar that was, that was the head of the Madhab Maliki. All right? Now, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, the governor, sends a note that, okay, time for him to go and get the ilm from Malik ibn Anas. But Malik ibn Anas was Imam Malik. He was somebody that pretty much did not like to engage with the rest of the people. He just had his, his house was far away. He had his, even his dars, even the dars, even like the class that he used to give, there's no dialogue in it. He would just say the hadith after a hadith after a hadith and leave. There's no dialogue. Unlike Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa, no. It's totally different. Imam Abu Hanifa, he would discuss with the students and they would uh, negotiate and they would go into debates with the Shaykh himself. Look at the difference. All right? Maybe he was autistic. That's maybe Asperger. Allahu A'lam. In the end, is that Imam Malik? Imam Malik, there was no dialogue. He did not want to engage with people either. So he would be on his own. But the governor in Medina received a note that this student, Muhammad ibn Idris, has to learn from this, the, this main shaykh, Imam Dar al -Hijra. So what does he do? Well, he gets all his people and gets, gets a, a, like the, the most important personnel in the government and goes to the house of Imam Malik, knocks at the door. The bonds girl comes out and hits her and tells her, I need to speak with Imam Malik. Imam Malik said, if, you ha if he has any questions, who's he talking to? The governor of Medina, the governor. If he's got any questions, 
let him write it down and send it send it with you. Tell him the bond's girl, the slave girl, that is. Let him send it with you and we'll write down the answer. If he wants to learn, he knows when our class times are at. So the governor said, no, no, no. It's none of that. Ready. It, already. It's none of that. It's none of that. So he said, I need to talk to him, and it has nothing to do with the class. It has nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with the class, and nothing to do with the question. So he comes out. Listen to this, girls. Listen to this. Imam Malik had farasa. What is farasa? Farasa, it's a deep end just by looking at the person. They saw with Nurillah, they saw with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would look at the person. And with Nurillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're able. Remember the hadith in, in the hadith Qudasi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time the person gets closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would become the sight that they see in. The sight that they see in, they will start to have. And they will start to have the sight Nuri Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through their eyes. Imam Malik looks at, looks at the note, looks at Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, who was only nine years old. Nine years old, you guys. Completed memorizing Quran, completed all the different, the different uh, important parts in fiqh. And then he said, Now, Shafi'i, Imam Malik comes in and looks at him. Imam Malik had farasa. And he said one very important thing. He said, Ya fata ittaqillah fasayakunu laka sha'nun azim. He said, O oh son, have taqwa because you're going to be something great. Oh, you're going to be something great. Now, remember, you guys, Imam Malik. Al Imam Malik was the Shaykh of Imam al Shafi'i. Alright? But look at the first thing he told him. You're gonna be something great. He saw in him. He's gonna be something great. But he told him one first advice. You're going to have to have taqwa. Because you're gonna be a main, you're gonna be something big one day. Sign him intelligence. He saw in him nur. And that's why he gave him that advice. Imam al-Shafi'i, then a main book of hadith was collected by Imam Malik and it's called Al-Muwatta. Al-Muwatta Al is in approximately maybe 900, 800 pages, in some copies at least. And it's all a hadith and athar. Hadith are different than athar because an athar would be based on the Sahabi, all right, or seven. But the hadith is based on the, the Prophet ﷺ. Hadith, everything that the Prophet ﷺ said, or whatever he did, or the reports on the Prophet ﷺ. Alright? Now what happened was, is that 
it was time for Shafi'i to memorize al muwatta Shafi'i memorized al muwatta in just a couple of days, almost nine days. Memorized it. In order to memorize it, he would cover one page so that he won't remember and memorize the other page before another page. He'd cover the page. What is this, a scanner? Right? Now, later Shafi'i becomes a grand scholar there. And then the Khalifa was told that there was a plot that a Shafi'i was trying to make in over to overthrow the Khalifa. So what does he do? They chain Al Imam al Shafi'i and take him in the middle of the desert all the way to Yemen. Chain in the middle of the desert. He was in Yemen. Then take him, bring him all the way back to Baghdad. Where's Baghdad? Iraq. They take him all the way to Iraq, chained in the middle of the desert, all the way to Iraq. When they go to Iraq, there he meets Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani is one of the main scholars of Abu Hanifa. One of the main scholars of who? Abu Hanifa, who's Abu Hanifa? You remember the scholar, the Madhab Hanafi. Where's the Madhab Hanafi spread at? Pakistanis are all Hanafi. Afghanis, they're all Hanafi. Indians are all Hanafi. You guys are what? Shafi. You have to know the story about now, Al Imam Shafi. Okay? Now, Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani, Imam Shafi learned from who? Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani. Muhammad al Hassan al Shaybani is the scholar of from what madhab? Abu Hanif. Madhab Hanafi. Now, Muhammad ibn al Hassan al Shaybani, the way that their madhab worked is totally different than the way the madhab Hanafi worked. The madhab Hanafi more worked in, in analyzing things. Madh Malik, Madh Malik never even left. Medina except for Hajj. Madhab Malik only worked in taking in taking the textual resources only. We'll come back after Salah inshallah. Allahu Akbar Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawm إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الصالين إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها وأخرجت الأرض أثقالها وقال الإنسان ما لها يومئذ تحدث أخبارها بأن ربك أوحى لها يومئذ يصدر الناس أشتاتا ليروا أعمالهم فمن يعمل مثقال ذرة خيرا يرى ومن يعمل مثقال ذرة شرا يرى
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Assalamualaikum Should we start, girls? Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, so that was just a short, just that was just a short story for um, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, Imam Malik, Abu Hanifa, Imam al-Shaybani. Why did I say this story? Because the story, the story just teaches us one, how the how talab al-ilm and seeking ilm actually comes with one with taqwa two open it it comes with taqwa 
too. It comes with traveling and going forward, traveling and taking the, the steps that are needed in order to seek the ilm. And it also comes with being humble. Now, one other thing that comes with zuhd, when we actually do zuhd, is the simple life. Simple life, and the more, <coughs> the more humble you are in being, sim in being simple, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually help your mind pick up the end that you want it to pick up. I want to show you just one, um, one scholar who I personally think um, is probably the most scholarly person living in our times today. And this guy is Muhammad ibn al-Hassan Wildin Dadu. This guy is from Mauritania. All right, this guy's from Mauritania, and when you actually hear his story and how they were learning in Mauritania, it really amazes me, because he says, as a young boy, we did not have any, we did not have any way of any tool, anything to play with. Seeking ilm was our only game. They didn't have any games. They didn't have anything. He said whenever we would walk around, we would only have in front of us the desert or we would have the sky. Those were the only two things around us. It was the plain empty the plain, empty, white deserts, or the blue sky, and that was the only thing that we could see. There was nothing for us to play. There was nothing to keep us busy, but or else we'll just be bored of doing nothing. I loved that very much, because a lot of times we tend to think the more toys buy for the kids and we tend to think that we we have to have more and more of entertaining things and and things designing our walls and all that is going to make us better scholars not necessarily the simpler your life is the less of all these different things around you the more your brain will be focused only to pick up the information that you want it to pick up. Now, remember, when you're sitting down, your brain is not only picking up what you are seeing in front of you, but your brain is picking up different information without you realizing unconsciously. When you're just unconscious about it, you're not even conscious about it, it's picking up information. Your brain, you're sitting down acquiring an end. Hmm? Just when she passed by, it distracted you. Right? Right? It distracted you. Until she sat down, your brain is settled to focus. Right? And that's the same thing. The less distraction around you, the more you'll get better focus when it comes to hifl, when it, can, when it comes to memorization. <clears throat> so if you want to sit and memorize, sit in an empty room. Sit in an empty place. Yes, reduce the colors, reduce the sound, reduce the different things. Don't think the more you have of that, that you're necessarily going to memorize better. Even a little distraction can take away your focus. And... Like I said, this guy, um, Muritani scholar, not very old, not very old, but is, is probably, like I said, one of the most scholarly, scholarly people living today in the amount, in the, the speed of memorization that he has. 
miraculous. The other example that I that I want to bring in is Zaid al Ma'an. In order to learn, in order to learn akhlaq, you always need a story, right? You always need a character to feel part of. You always need to imagine like a character that you're part of. And that's why movies actually make up probably the most dangerous or the most best or the best tools in changing the akhlaq in any society. Because without you realizing, I'll tell you here, when I was here in, in America, when I was in sixth, in sixth grade here in Minnesota, talking about homosexuality could get you in, de in detention straight there. Detention. Even if you just say the word homo, that's called detention. Straight detention room, that's it. And maybe even get, getting, getting you out for a couple of days and getting suspended. By the time I was in high school, senior high school, everybody was talking about it like it was just their leisure time. By the time I was in high school, in just from sixth grade to twelfth grade, in just six years, not very long, in just six school years, everything changed. What made the, the fast and dramatic change? Movies. Hollywood changed the whole society's understanding of akhlaq. Why? Because in order to change anybody, whether to the good or to the bad, they have to have a character who they see themselves in it in order to imitate and take as a role model. Now, Ibn al-Qayyim Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah he was a scholar um, from Bilad al-Sham, from Syria, and he wrote this book, which I very much loved and just, you could see it's on those six volumes. And the book is about the Prophet ﷺ, but it's not about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, like the normal way they would write seerah. No. The way, when he wrote the book, he didn't necessarily sit in, a, in an office and start writing the book. No. He was actually on a journey. So whenever it was time to rest, which would be at night, he would start taking glimpse. The word is glimpse. He would be taking glimpse from the life and the story of the Prophet ﷺ and start writing about it. And he would say in that book, for example, he would say, Hadji Rasul ﷺ fil Hajj. Hadji Rasul ﷺ the hadji meaning the, the guidance in the way that he was walking. And he would talk about the different types of, the different gates, like the different ways of walking. Somebody that walks with a, with somewhat of a, of a, of a moving left to right gait. Somebody that's moving with not a stable gait. Somebody that's moving with a dancing gait. And he would say, Every single characteristic, every single behavior of that, just by looking at the gates and what to learn and how to scan people's personalities just from the way they walk, the way they talk, and how he learned that by studying the, the Prophet ﷺ, the way he talked, the way he the way he dressed, the way he dealt with his family, etc. When you look at Zaid al Ma'ad, and he would even write, by the way, in his book, that he is now, that I am, he would say, I'm writing the book right now under the full moon. Under full moon. 
There's no light. He's just getting the moonlight. And that was his lamp in order to write this. Rahib, huh? I love it. And, it just, and that's why I called it Zab al Ma'ad. Zab, it's like the shelter, like the, the food that you take with you on a journey. And that was Ibn Qayyim. When he went, the, the book is translated. I don't know what the, the translation, um, how they translated the, the, the title of the book, but it is translated. Now, mentioning the stories of the, the, the pious people makes you want to imitate the Salihin. Umar ibn al Khattab said, <laughs> Eliminate evil by not talking about it. Meaning what? When you're in your gathering, when you're around people, don't necessarily say, oh, guess what? This is happening at school and this is what they do and all these different things. No. Don't even mention these things. Replace it by talking about what the Salihin do. If we're always constantly talking about what non-Salihin are doing. Let's talk about what the Salihin are doing in order for you to feel that you want to compete, that you want to imitate that. Talking about Salihin will bring about the encouragement. Raja ibn Hayawa, who's Raja ibn Hayawa? Raja ibn Hayawa is, he used to be a Christian. His family was, they were Christian from Palestine. When Umar ibn al-Khattab, <coughs> when Umar ibn al-Khattab over, uh, well, when Umar al-Khattab uh, opened uh, Al-Quds, Raja ibn Hayawa was one of the, fam- the Christian families that were there. He became Muslim at the age of 15. He became Muslim at the age of 15. At 15 years old, he became Muslim. They were Christian. <coughs> Raja ibn Hayawa becomes one of the main scholars. Remember, at the age of 15, becomes Muslim, versus Islam, and then later becomes one of the main Scholars, he said, "Hadithna wala tuhadithna an mutamawitan wala tuhan." Like, tell us stories, but don't tell us a story stories about somebody that is just running like after dunya, and don't tell us about somebody that is just of evil things. Somebody that deserves and just. Somebody that is just running after dunya or somebody that is only deserving um, or you can only describe that person with evil descriptions. In other words, what? Don't describe people that are that have evil characteristics. You hear that about you hear about those a lot. But describe people that have good characteristics in order to encourage you. Let me end right here so we can remember. So we're at, um, we're at slide 41. All right. And then we are pretty much, pretty much halfway or close to half the book. Pretty much close to half the book for Haliyat al-Talib. Yet... There are some things in uh, the book that I may not have mentioned, may not have mentioned, um, because I feel that um, it comes from a different, um, I don't want to say background, but more from a different culture, which we'll talk about the culture part, inshallah, um, later on. But before we end, anybody has any questions? Oh, speaking about questions, we will also talk about next week. Let me tell you what we're going to talk about next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about um, seeking ilm through shuyukh. We're going to be talking about um, how to start seeking ilm and what are the main topics to seek ilm in and what are the most important sciences we should start with. And as women... As women, what are the most important sciences we should start with? And as women, studying abroad, is it okay to study abroad? Is it okay to go without mahram? Um, regulations for women's education, 
when I want to seek ilm with, let's say, a male shaykh, what are the different things that I should consider? And um, be, how to be a shaykh or a shaykha? What's the difference between shaykh or a shaykha? Manners with a shaykh, different manners with a shaykh. Um, and inshallah, we'll, that, that'll be our topic for next week, inshallah. Any questions before we end right here? It doesn't have to be related to the topic. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I was wondering, like, what the Prophet did, if it's considered sunnah, like, as. Did, uh, in what? Like, 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 he did, like, culture or pastry. What he did in, like, cultural things, for example? Yeah, like, um, for example, like, wearing clean food, or more cultural care things out. than that. Or going to care out. Like, is that you gave it away. That? Do you consider it sunnah or is it just something that the Prophet Oh, do you consider it a sunnah or something that the Prophet ﷺ? Um, so generally it is considered it is considered part of the sunnah because sunnah sunnah comes in four different terms. Alright? Sunnah Sunnah comes in four different terms, but from the term of muhaddithin, meaning that everything that the Prophet ﷺ did so everything that the Prophet ﷺ did or a description for the Prophet ﷺ, or something that he said or a report about the Prophet ﷺ, is considered part of Sunnah meaning it's part of the reference now for the things that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, for the things that the Prophet ﷺ himself did as for us to imitate him in that would be considered a sunnah for us to imitate him in unless he ordered us to do it. For example, he said, Sallu kama usalli. Pray as you see me pray. Does that make it sunnah? No. It makes it from the, in terms of reference, it being from the reference of sunnah, does not make it not obligatory. Is everyone understanding me? Maybe let me make it clear like this. Hold on. Let, let me write it down right here. There are different there are different there are different terms for the word sunnah. Alright? The word sunnah the word sunnah would differ based on the the ilm that is using it. The word sunnah the word sunnah can mean the ilm itself, the, the, the ilm of hadith, for example, the, the meaning sunnah as a resource. As a resource. Sunnah can mean recommended. And this is really important to mention because if something is sunnah, meaning from the standpoint of a resource, from the standpoint of a resource does not necessarily mean that it's recommended. It can be something from a standpoint of resource. It's sunnah, meaning it's a, it's part of the sunnah, meaning from this resource standpoint. But it's, it is obligatory to do. This is from usul al-fiqh standpoint. Usul al-fiqh standpoint would be, I mean, it would, it would be recommended. From the standpoint of a resource, like a masdar masadar tashriya, Masdar, meaning resource. All scholars would agree because the Quran actually said, wa Allah, wa Rasul. And obey Allah and obey His Messenger. All Muslims, all scholars agreed that Sunnah, meaning the resource, anything that the Prophet ﷺ said, did, or was reported on the Prophet ﷺ, is a resource that we must take we must take as a reference to help us understand the definition of right and wrong and we're supposed to imitate the Prophet ﷺ in. But the part that the Prophet ﷺ, when it comes to recommendation uh, sense, if the words of the Prophet ﷺ or if the action of the Prophet ﷺ was not coming as a legislature, but more like you said, like his, his lifestyle, etc. And he did not order us to do it, but he was just doing it, uh, doing it um, just himself. Then, 
scholars had two different opinions on that. First opinion is that you will be rewarded. You will be rewarded if you had the intention to imitate the Prophet. Abdullah ibn Umar was the one was one of the main Sahaba that whenever he would see the Prophet, for example, scratch his head. He'll scratch his head like that. If he would see the Prophet make his his um, camel or his horse go around a certain pole, he'll make it go around a certain pole. If he puts crosses his legs, he'll cross his legs. Anything the Prophet does, he'll do. Nobody used to imitate the Prophet as much as Abdullah ibn Umar. If you imitate the Prophet just for the sake of imitating the Prophet you'll get rewarded for that. The other opinion is that it would be it would be you would get the re, the reward of sunnah if you would have if it was done from the Prophet as a tashriya, like it was more of of a of a legislature for the ummah, unless. This is something just for the Prophet ﷺ, which we, which would we would call khas bi So if it's something only for the Prophet ﷺ, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, he married more than four. That was only for the Prophet ﷺ. We can't say we want to imitate the Prophet ﷺ. That was just for the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, did certain certain things that was just for him. He was he was able to do wisal, meaning like pray. I mean, sorry, but fast consecutive days. We can't do that. Alright? Did I answer your question? No? What is your question? But I, um, I kind of want to kind of Evidences for what? Like, um, like, whoever said it, whoever had it. Said what? A comment on it. Like, the father's had a comment on it. Comment on what? I'm confused. Like, like, like about that she means the opinion. Yeah. Who, like, who held the both of the, of the two opinions? Like, okay, so my original question was, how would you answer this? Yeah, like what the, what the path is like, like on a daily basis that we would put it in there or not? She answered. Yeah, she I answered. answered. She told me a good question. But, um, she wanted to know, like, the two opinions who held them, like, 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 the different scholars. Like, Do you want me, like, to give you references? Yeah. All right, I'll give you references, inshallah. Any other question? Go ahead. How about if uh, a concerning prophet had something to do with isn't part of your culture? If the Prophet did something isn't part of your culture? If the Prophet did something that isn't part of your culture, your if that particular piece of sunnah, if it's obligatory, the Prophet Sallam's Sunnah or action, if it's obligatory, it becomes ma mandation for you to practice, not the culture. Because when I have a culture that uh, that um, that contradicts anything that Islam mentions, it would be jahiliyyah to take the culture and leave the Prophet sallam's the Prophet sallam's order if it's mandatory. Two, if it's a sunnah. If it's a sunnah and your culture contradicts it, you'll, re you'll be rewarded for imitating the Prophet ﷺ and you will be rewarded for doing the sunnah and that would be part of your jihad, to actually do the sunnah. Alright? Now, if for example, let's say the culture, alright, let's just assume, alright, we look at, we look at, for example, the Prophet ﷺ used to put al ithman, which is like, um, uh, it's not eyeliner, but yeah. view the person that does that as acting somehow feminine, all right? And you might lose a lot of people because they they don't really they they will accuse you of being if it's a man, for example, accuse you of being feminine then we would say you can leave that particular piece of sunnah because you, because you want to get to another sunnah, which is to reach to the hearts of people, for example. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it depends. It's not one answer there. 
if there's a bigger maslaha. So if the maslaha or the benefit is to bring more people to the sunnah, then that would be okay to leave the sunnah for the sake of that. Let's just assume, okay? Let's say a sister said that um, said that she, let's say a professor, all right? And she said that if I would, for example, all right, she said, you know, I know that the sunnah is wearing, for example, uh, niqab, all right? And she said, but I didn't want to wear the niqab because I felt that I might actually lose more people, for example. I might lose more people to listen to, let's say, my physics class or whatever, medicine or whatever, right? So I, she decided that she wanted to leave, for example, covering, covering the face, for example. Regardless of what the opinion I don't necessarily regard that wearing niqab is necessarily obligatory, but it is a sunnah. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. Um, but at the same time, let's say she took that opinion. Yijus, yijus. For example, she felt that if I would, for example, she's a university professor or a doctor or something like that. And I've had um, some of my students that said she's a doctor and she said that um, she wondered if she can take off and call because of that. So soon, for example, she thought that would be a bigger benefit. All right, this is just an example. All right, um, any other question? Go ahead. What's the ruling on men braiding their hair? Generally, when it comes to men braiding their hair, it depends on the culture in that area. So if in that culture, in that area, if men braiding their hair was considered imitating women, then it would be haram to do. But if in that culture, like for example, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, men used to braid their hair. But if in, let's say in your culture, braiding, uh, men braiding their hair is imitating women, then it would be haram. All right? It would be haram because... Um, imitating men imitating women and women imitating men would be a lot of it is is um, determined by the culture itself. Go ahead. Growing out their hair. What do you mean growing out? Oh, sure. making their hair long, Yanni. Same thing. Same thing. When it comes to when it comes to I don't know braiding and. Growing out their hair depends on it depends on the culture. If within that culture, men growing their hair is considered feminine, it would be haram to imitate women. If it wasn't something that was considered feminine, not just feminine. So when it comes to dress, you you ask sweetie, listen. When it comes to dress, generally one, if there's nothing in Islam that says that it's haram to dress that way, it would be we would go for the second rule. So let's do it here. When it comes to dress, when it comes to clothing, one, if we have nothing in, in Islam, so no text saying that this is haram, no, set, no text forbidding, then it would be okay, okay? On a condition, on the following condition. All right? The following condition that it would not be imitate men imitating women or women imitating men. On another condition, not imitating fasad, those that are those that are considered as illicit or ill mannered or people that are sinners. On another condition that it would not reveal Allah when it comes to clothes. We we'll look at these these parts. So, if you have no text forbidden, let's say one text forbidden. For example, men shaving their beard. There's a text that forbidden's. Oh, we don't say what the culture says. No, we say there's a text. Oh, there's a text. Men can't shave their beard. Clear text. Imitating. 
Then we would say, all right, well, let's see the clothes. Are they imitate, men imitating women or women imitating men? We would look at that. There we would look at the culture. Culture, we would consider if there is no text that contradicts it. We would not always consider culture. If there's a, if there's a culture where the text says no, we don't say, oh, but the culture says yes. No, we say, we don't, we don't consider culture when there's a text telling me this is do, do not do. Culture that guys would look cool if they would wear gold. We would say, no, there's one hadith. There's a hadith that clearly prohibits men from wearing gold, for example. You understand what I'm saying? Did I answer your question? All right, go ahead. How about if uh, a cause people in your culture to look at you as strangely? If it causes people within your culture to look at you strangely? Yeah, it's not normal in your culture. So generally, um, attracting, attracting people's eyes, if, for example, there's no text that forbiddens, all right, let's just suppose. All right, you dress, you're Somali, you dress the Somali attire. You know, but let's just assume you wanted to dress the Pakistani attire. All right, you wanted to wear the Pakistani attire. That's definitely going to draw attention. Let's dress, you're Somali, dress the Somali attire. All right, nothing wrong with the Pakistani attire if it has... The conditions of hijab. The conditions of hijab are what? Number one. Let's do it. Let's do another one. All right. What are the conditions of hijab? Covering. Covering what? Covering all the body. Hands and face. Hands and face. Well, I don't want to say excluded, but it's actually a sunnah. It's not necessarily. There are strong hadith that actually talk about uh, covering the, 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 the face. Strong hadith, and there are strong opinions. When it comes to covering the hands and, and the face, all right, there are strong hadith. So it's not excluded, but differences of opinions between scholars. All right? And let's continue. Covering all the body. Two. Not see through. Okay, what else? Not tight. What else? Not fragrance. Not bright? Causing a attraction? So, okay, attraction. Let's, let's talk about that. Like meaning what? Adorn? Uh, like ornaments and stuff? All right, ornaments, okay. What else? What else? Not imitating, not imitating the dress of men or for sale or non Muslim groups or deviated groups. Right now, if we look at all these, okay, we look at all, all these. If, for example, because you're wearing your hijab and your, let's say, your, your family or your culture, that wasn't something common, you don't say, well, I guess I'll take off my hijab because, because I'm standing out with my abay or hijab. No, nope. you don't do that. That's, you hold on to your hijab. All right, but if let's say right this one, the ornament, the ornament part. Let's say for example you're Sudani. Sudanese, they would wear yellow, bright orange, you know the, these colors. Um, if you're Mauritani, light blue. All right. Now, why do they wear those colors? Well, because their climate is so hot. 
that they have to wear bright colors. So if you're Sudanese and you decided to wear yellow, for example, it's part of your culture. White, they would even wear white. All right, so in this, in this, in your culture, it's considered an ornament, right? In my culture, same thing, it's considered an ornament. But in your culture, it's not. That's when we would regard the culture. In the details of the details, you see it? You see what I'm saying? We don't regard it in the base, but we would regard it in the details. That's why when we say that culture is a considerable resource only when it doesn't contradict the text. Two, if the text is telling me to go back to the culture, the text itself is telling me go back to the culture for the details in order to give the ruling. All right? That's when I would I would look at the at the culture. The details of the details and on the condition that it doesn't contradict the text. Any other questions? All right. We'll see you guys next week. Inshallah. How do we get the link of the book? Um, it's available, Tamina. It's it's available online. Um, I'll I'll lay it out, inshallah. <laughs> Is it, hold on, let's do it here. Hold on, we're not going to. Is it haram to wear jewelry in salah? No, it's not haram to wear jewelry in salah. Um, jewelry, jewelry is tradition like in, when we're talking about, for example, mahram, that you're supposed to, that you should not reveal your ornaments. That's when you're in front of non mahram but not for salah. All right. Oh yeah, at home you can wear.